You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Radio Public, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for November 8th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Illinois headquarters of Mike Bloomberg 2020, it's The Professional Left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. And on a completely unrelated note, we'd like to welcome our newest sponsor, Mike Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Bloomberg, he's rich. What more do you need to know? Yeah. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah, we figured if Steve Schmidt could suddenly pretend to grow a conscience and then get a Never Trumper gig on MSNBC and then sell out those principles without breaking stride when Howard Schultz waved a lot of money in his face, and then when Schultz cratered, re-reverse himself and resume his gig at MSNBC with nobody asking any questions, well, we here at the Cornfield Resistance could let Bloomberg pay for our grass and our groceries and maybe a new house <laughs> and maybe a vacation house, and then come He's back. kidding. And then come back in a few months as if it never happened. And you would all yeah. understand, because this is just how politics is done. Yeah, Money that's not bitches. it. But you know what talks more than money, honey? No. Coffee. 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 <laughs> and we would like to thank Bart for the coffee. Bart sent us a bunch of coffee, ground coffee, and some macadamia nuts, everything from Hawaii. It's very delicious. We had a Kona coffee for breakfast this morning. It was very, very good. We got the, the Howard Schultz gift <laughs> basket, basically, but it wasn't, it wasn't Starbucks. It was hand-selected by Bart, who sent it yeah. to us from halfway across it's the globe. It's very, really very good. That. Thank you. Thank you. And it's delicious. We also wanted to thank uh, our friend, friend of the pod, Barry Maurer, who has a book he's put together called Deadly Delusions. Uh, it's it's really an art book. Um, it's <laughs> He does selfies. It's a graphic yeah, novel almost. Selfies yeah. with farm animals. And then uh, turns that into a comic book where he is talking with the farm animals who can talk um, about political issues and uh you know it reminds me a lot of zayas nation if you're an old school blogger yeah. and you know uh zayas dr, dr. Zayas, zayas i remember it well uh, yeah. it's it is a lot like that except this is with farm animals and uh very well done and I, he's looking for a publisher i hope he finds one uh what, one of these days we're going to do a podcast of nothing but people who no longer blog <laughs> who we knew back in the day that's true yeah. Be a very, it'll go well over I one miss hour. Zayas. He was very um, funny, and I, and, too. Uh, I um, met him at face to face at a uh, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State conference. And mm -hmm. boy, that was old school. That was a long time ago, yeah. long, long time ago. Well, and this means that we actually have you know archives and memory yeah. and history yeah. that we can draw on. Yeah. Um, just FYI, I'd like to thank everyone for all of your thoughts and your your energies and your prayers and everything else you directed in, uh, in my way. Uh, my, I'm back from visiting my hippie mom in Arizona, where she lives on the same property as my sister. Uh, brother and I converged there, and we were there for several days. Um, uh, she's doing much better. She is still um, homebound. And will require a lot of well, medical attention. Well, she's out of the attention. hospital too. I mean, this this right. this is there's a deeper crisis that went on. But yes, the point is she's, she's out, of the, out of the hospital. She's home. She can't run around as much and do all the yoga stuff. Everything she wants to do because her energy right. level is phenomenal. Um, well, and she she has a lot of um, and the same time. Just FYI, this is just housekeeping. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister's husband had a very serious heart yeah. problem at exactly Crisis. the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And they also had identity theft at oh, exactly Lord. the same time. Somebody, uh, you know, got his computer, got their information. So almost overnight, my sister was dealing with both of the adults on the other adults on the property, on both hospitalized mm -hmm. and or unable to drive or do anything really errand related and dealing with the banks and crisis and so on and so forth. So uh, it was a good thing we went yep. out there. And um, I thank God for Medicare. Honestly. Uh, honest to God. The, um, the number of services that are provided for someone uh, in this position, uh, it required essentially all of us filling out forms and making calls and making appointments and setting up things and making sure there's no overlap and making sure the wording is correct and making sure her long-term insurance doesn't overlap or does overlap. 
But that, that was all paperwork. Mm-hmm. The actual care being provided was uh, wonderful. The people are terrific. They're full of good advice. They're professionals. They know what they're doing. They come to our house. And this is a house in the mountains. Yeah. This is a house where on Halloween, uh, they put out pumpkins so the javelinas can come and knock them over <laughs> and eat them. It would be wild, wild boars. boars in, in the mountains is, of Arizona. Yeah. This is where this is a property where snakes fight with squirrels on their front porch. And usually the squirrel wow. wins, which pretty some pretty those are our squirrels are yeah. wins compared to the yeah. squirrels out there. So uh but it's it's covered. Um and it was mostly a matter of just making sure all of the various overlapping doctors and home care specialists and therapists were all scheduled correctly and not overlapping and someone was present and and then my sister got you know five minutes she to got a little bit breathe. of respite care for three days yeah, yeah she de- she yeah. needed that very much so we love her and we love your the, mom yeah uh, love your yeah. brother Took lots of pictures so, and you know I, I had to answer a lot of cross-examination about why I didn't bring back hoodies for the girls oh yeah why said, don't you bring us back I hoodies went, from arizona because <laughs> <laughs> i went straight there and i went straight yeah. back and that's uh, this is not a hoodie trip. No, this was a usually you bring back trip. hoodies of some variety, but that's okay. They have a lot of hoodies. I'm not worried about lack of hoodies upstairs in our house. Uh, let me tell you, the um, one of the things, despite health concerns and mom being on oxygen and so on, that we got to do, which is something my family has always done, back to when we were little children sitting at the middle, was gather around and tell funny yeah. stories yeah. and crack each other up. This is a, I come from a long line of storytelling goofballs and, and uh, uh, hillbillies and uh, rogue Irishmen and so on and so forth. So whatever traits I have that you hear in my voice, I come by. <laughs> and that was just, that was extremely um, balming to my soul. Ooh, yeah. Just sitting around talking about, you know, talking shit about ancestors who are no longer here and just having fun. And we always tell the best stories on ourselves. We race to the middle to say, Look at the stupid thing I just did and try to crack everyone up. So well, and and was, uh, everyone in your family is on the same side politically. So that helps a lot. Oh, yeah. Um yeah. there yes. there were times while you were gone when I could hear the eye rolls from your sister as you brought up politics <laughs> in her house. Yeah. Well, you know, here here's the thing. I, I strove mightily and succeeded mostly to keep politics completely yeah, out of everything. Yeah, there was too much going on for you to start yeah. bloviating about. And by the way, this is but what you know Driftglass thinks about what's happening. Yes, right. But you know who brought it up? My mom did. Yeah. So yeah. like, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and mostly centered around her and my sisters, one of their, their guilty pleasures watching Dancing with the Stars. And so we got, you have to get all into the Sean Spicer cheating scandal. Yeah. Him telling people in your mother's time zone to right. vote before they've seen the dancing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Go 20 times. Go 20 times. Yeah. Uh, with, all of which means I've been out of the loop for most of the last week. And I will tell you, stepping back into the fire hose uh-huh. of crazy is uh, bracing <laughs> and weird. And just even taking a few days out of it and walking back into this just sort of bombardment yeah. of of smoking guns from the White House absolutely corrupt deliberately corrupt and corrosive and abusive and degenerate behavior on the part of republicans defending them and then the the mob of of idiots on twitter who just (laughs) seize on everything and attack everyone because this really is defend the hive for Mm -hmm. god's sakes defend the hive yeah yeah. and we're stuck knowing how this is going to end one way or another he'll Mm -hmm. leave maybe maybe impeachment probably not removal 2020 very likely so and then all the shit that falls apart and comes out will suddenly become someone else's problem because all the Trump supporters will suddenly become independents who've never heard of Donald Trump. Well, and, it, and Amanda Marcotte owes me $5 this week because she wrote really? an article in Salon uh, that's republished at um, Raw Story today about not letting Republicans get away with rebranding oh. after oh Trump. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. so. You know who else is cracking wise about, you know, here's what's going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. David Frum. Yeah. Yeah. You and think- I loved I loved how. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, go ahead. I was David say, you, saying that. Yeah. David Frum, George Bush advisor uh, <laughs> and speech writer and a guy who wrote a couple of glowing books or at least one glowing book about George W. Bush. You think that guy, however much he might have come out of his um, 
complete Republican ownership of his body and soul mm-hmm. would know better than to say, you know what these crazy Republicans are going to do? They're probably going to pretend this never happened and get them off the hook. And then yeah. maybe they'll get a and then Michelle he- Goldberg came in. That was the thing. I couldn't remember her name. Michelle Goldberg replied to him and said, no, they're going to pretend Trump wasn't a real Republican. That's right. And, and for ha- someone who is now a respected MSNBC contributor and a managing <laughs> editor of The Atlantic who and helped- probably goes to Politicon. <laughs> yeah. And who helped George Bush nearly destroy this country. Right. Um, to say, you know, those kooky Republicans, they're probably going <laughs> to... It's like... You think? You really you- have... Well, and it's that sense, it's this sense of entitlement. Yeah. It's this sense of, yeah. I get to do this because I'm on the inside. I'm a member of the Beltway Media. However badly I fuck up in public, doesn't matter because I'm off the hook. I'm, I am pre approved for everything I'm going to do. And, and speaking anything- of Beltway Media. Yeah. Yes. Oh, please, please, please. Let's, let's segue right away into um, an article that both Carolee and uh, Ten Grain sent me. Yes. Uh, uh, me, me too. It was like, too. I, yeah. I, I can't believe this. You should read this. Yeah. Like, okay. yeah. And, right. and I said on Twitter, tweeted to the author of this article, John F. Harris. He's a senior founding editor at Politico, who's now retiring from that and doing a weekly column. I tweeted to him. Good for you. I, you know, no, no snark. This is a good confession to make. And this is the kind of thing that we look for for mainstream media people. To come out and say, this is the way things are, and I'm a part of it, and I'm part of the problem, or have been part of the problem, and suggest some remedies, or at least suggest a perspective that might help to resolve the problem. And the problem is centrism. Yes. Um, The the article is called One Big Thing the Dems. Now, there's where he's wrong. (laughs) The one big thing the Dems get wrong about Warren. What he means by the Dems is Rahm Emanuel. Yes. He doesn't, he's not talking about you and me and anyone listening to this podcast. He's talking about uh, Beltway Insider Democratic War Room uh, professionals yeah. who are campaigners. Um, People who yuck it up on, column, and, on on panels with David Brooks about, oh, the crazies on Brooks. both sides. Isn't this a yeah. shame? Yeah. Left, left wing crazy people aren't real. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, John Harris, I'm going to just read a couple paragraphs from it. Um, A quarter century covering national politics has convinced me that the more pervasive force shaping coverage of Washington and elections is what might be thought of as centrist bias Mm -hmm. flowing from reporters and sources alike. It is a headwind for Warren, Sanders, the squad on Capitol Hill, even for Trump. This bias is marked by an instinctual suspicion of anything suggesting ideological zealotry, an admiration for difference splitting, a conviction that politics should be a tidier and more rational process than it usually is. A confession. I've got it. A pretty strong bout, actually. Here's the main reason it might be wrong. (laughs) The most consequential history is usually not driven by the center. It is clear that Warren, who has so far run the most disruptive and effective campaign of the Democratic race, is ready to divide the country and her party over the proposition that a much more aggressive role for government is needed to bring business to heel and to protect individuals and the global climate from the predations of a free market. Mm-hmm. Sanders has won a core of devoted backers animated by the same disdain for centrism. Yep. And then his last paragraph is near the end is fundamental societal change comes from people burning with grievances, obsessed with remedies, ready to demolish old power arrangements to achieve their ends. And the thing I think he leaves out of that ending is the, the part that Chris Hayes brings up in his book, um, Twilight of the Elites, Mm -hmm. where this push for remedies and change and the people burning with grievances are the middle-class, college-educated white people uh, who expected better from Mm -hmm. their government than they got. That's right. And so they pushed government to change. And it you talk about entitlement. It's, It's that entitled class that feels they deserve these things that winds up being the burning agent of 
tearing down the old structures. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, you know, that brings up issues of privilege and all kinds of things that we can talk about at length in other podcasts. But I said kudos to him for pointing out his own biases and noting that, uh, you know, the Democratic base, (laughs) it wants change. They They want they want government to govern. And they don't want to burn it all down, corrupt duopoly. They they have a really specific, if you go through any of the candidates, well, almost any of the candidates' um, plans, they have really specific plans about schools and criminal justice reform and climate change and health care and and every issue that that you care about and and I care about and that I assume everyone listening to this podcast cares about. So it's no, there's no lack of policy available on the left to choose from. This is, mm-hmm. I, I listened to Ilima Stahl this morning uh, on yes. the radio, stealing from me, just blatantly stealing from me. Um, My TV husband. I, I say it in love because we're, you know, we have an open relationship when it comes to TV husbands and wives. So, so the, but his point was, one you probably heard in this podcast many times, is that when all of the reasonable people in politics are stuck in one party because the other party is insane, right. you're going to have disagreements because reasonable people disagree. And there's people in, in the Democratic Party who are who are further left than I am. And there's people in the Democratic Party who are way further right than I am and way too obsessively centrist. I am not a centrist. I do not crave centrism because centrism is a mathematical function. It simply says whatever the position is on the right – and the imaginary position is on the left, which is usually completely wrong and invented just to create centrism. Um, the exact midpoint between the two is where you should be, period. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter how far right the moves, uh, how far uh, the right moves into crazy town, they'll keep moving the center along so that the midpoint is always the midpoint. That is a, 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 that's a, a coward, an act of cowardice. It's an act of laziness. It's where people who don't want to pick a side in a cold civil war, which is what we're having, hide because they don't want to pick a side because picking a side is terrifying. They don't want to admit that the right is as bad as it is. I think all of that is bullshit and toxic and it has destroyed basically our media. I am a fan of press. Aren't you waiting for the Republican epiphany to come? I keep waiting, Blue Gal. Every (laughs) every Christmas, I light a little candle and put it in the window and say, (laughs) Oh, Santa, please bring me the reasonable Republicans that I've heard so much about, and they never fucking show up. <laughs> Instead, there's a big pile of shit in the living room, and I dig through it going, but there must be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> so, as I am long on that, record... That is a reference to the one of the leading candidates, though, in the, yes. in the Democratic Party. Well, Joe Biden and, is suggesting yeah. that... Uh, actually, we will be able to cross the aisle and get along with Republicans yeah. after this election. And it, it pains me that he missed the entire Obama administration. It's a pity he didn't play a large part in that <laughs> a administration. Very large role in the that, Obama where that administration. might stick in his mind that oh, we we tried to compromise like a million times, and every time they they we pulled back a stump, and they called us you know insane and a Kenyan communist and so forth. So I, I know that that is how he's wired. Yeah, and that's the problem. Uh, once you know how the how how he's wired you can get around it you just keep making insane demands and joe biden gives you half of what you want oh really i'd like seven trillion dollars you'll give me three and a half trillion great i want to destroy two earths oh only one okay we'll just do the one so it does that compulsive need to sell out half of your party every time the republicans make a ludicrous demand is what got us into this situation and that's exactly why i i am with Sanders and Warren on health care. Yes, yes. I'm going to yes. ask for a thousand Medicare's, right. <laughs> and, and maybe I'll get five hundred Medicare's. Right. I, I want don't a thousand know. Medicare's. I want a million, yeah. me- well, and million that's the- Medicare's. And what? here's the difference: eighty-nine billion trillion dollars for health care in the United right. States. Oh, well, I'm only going to get three trillion. Okay, right. you know what? I want a quadrillion. Quadrillion. I want a thousand trillion dollars for Medicare. From I'm, not gonna take, <laughs> from I'm not going to take Mexico. I'm not going to take a penny less. Right. Um, but that's that's the difference. I am. I think centrism is an act of political cowardice, and it's also extremely profitable cowardice. What I uh, what I am willing to talk about is pragmatism. Yeah. That once you get to a place where we all can agree, everyone should have health care. It should be excellent for everyone, and it should be as as inexpensive as possible without being cheap and and useless. Yep. Then we can all get into the pit and punch each other and fight and argue about how best to achieve that. But you don't start off negotiating by saying, well, of course, I'm going to give half of what you want away. Let's just right. do that up front. 
that's how we got the Affordable Care Act without a public option. We yeah. got it because Joe Lieberman and a couple of other blue dog Democrats stabbed us in the back. But the whole ACA argument it, it, it's strangely forgotten that Republicans were given pretty much the ability to, to amend it any way they wanted. Right. Right. 140, 150 some odd amendments. The one thing they weren't allowed to do was put in poison pill amendments that right. would destroy it because that would be insane. Barack Obama went to their conference in Baltimore and he stood in front of the entire Republican Party and fielded all the questions they could ever want to ask. And in the end, he got nothing for it. Nothing. Not one fucking Republican voted for it because obstructing Democrats, owning the libs is all they know how to do. So I'm a pragmatist, but not a centrist. Secondly, I want to point out that this headwind for Sanders mm -hmm. is is never a headwind for Republicans. Right. That's the part about it that gets undiscussed. Well, and I, I noticed that this week with, with people talking about how the impeachment vote is so partisan. You know what? We never talked about the 60 votes to destroy my health insurance as no. being partisan. Oh, no. And let's be clear. Uh, Blue Gal's not talking about 60 votes required in the Senate. It means the 60 no. times the 60 Republican times Party voted. 60 times the Republican Party voted to end the ACA. Yeah, to take away our health care. And yeah. that's just lost to history. So yeah. there is obviously very partisan drift glass. <laughs> and I am very partisan. And as, as we said last week, three cheers for partisanship. The uh, the part of this that gets sort of unmentioned, but is clearly there is this obsession by centrists with tribalism. Isn't mm -hmm. it a shame? Mm -hmm. the, the blue tribe, and the red tribe and the black tribe and the white tribe and blah, blah, blah. And that's how we're divided as if there's no actual moral content, any position anyone takes. It's just a side you're on. It's just Cubs or White Sox. It's it's uh it's Mets or Yankees. There's no actual there. There doesn't affect anyone's life, which position you take. Um, but there is a third tribe, and it's the most uh, rigid and obsessive and ridiculous of all, and that is the centrist tribe. Right. The tribe that reduces every argument, every discussion to, well, there's some on the left and there's some on the right, and who knows who, who's right? Maybe in the middle we'll, we'll find a solution. But they if give that, away the game, Drift Glass, so you know, often, like they did, like Chuck Todd did this week. Do you want to talk about that? Election you. Eve, Chuck if, Todd says. If Republicans in a red state like Kentucky manage to hang on to a Republican governor's position, you got no one to blame but Nancy Pelosi. Really, it's, uh, <laughs> all Pelosi's fault. it's all impeachment's fault if a Republican wins in a red state. <laughs> now, honestly, if anyone else in any public profession that had an outward facing uh, position uh, said something that spectacularly stupid, in front and was of then proven people. wrong in 24 hours. And right. If you go, if you go. <laughs> but Chuck Todd is hired to say shit like this by Comcast. That's his job. Yeah. His job is to find the reason why it's always good news for John McCain. That's mm -hmm. his job. And that's that's the force at work. The, the question I keep asking of anyone who will tell me, and occasionally answers trickle back to me saying, you're right, that's how it works, which depresses the show, <laughs> is, is there is like the dark matter of media, this invisible force that keeps people doing shit that they know is a lie, that we know is a lie, that most of their audience knows is a lie, the corporations that, that, that uh, prop them up know is a lie. And the question is, why are you continuing to do this? Why, why must you continue to ache for the non-existent center? Why must you continue to blame non-existent liberal positions as a way to counterbalance actual Republican atrocities. Why, 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 why? And the answer is always, well, that's just how business is done. I get it. There's a lot of ways businesses are done, but there's a reason for it. There's a person or people or a compact or a cabal or a pact or mutual understanding that says, this is how we're going to run shit. We're never going to hold Republicans responsible exclusively for what they do. And when Republicans actually show their ass in public, and make it really clear that they are the cancer on democracy. Their party is the problem. We're going to call them Trumpists and Trumpers. Yeah. And it's Trumpism. It's not Republicanism because, you know, I, 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 as a Republican, I never believed those things. That was never part of my party, says Joe Scarborough. That's not what my party believed, uh, says every Republican on MSNBC, except it was. It really was. So I'm still looking for someone to step out of the shadows, like, say, a whistleblower. And tell me, <laughs> why is it that you people, the, 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 the First Amendment chartered institution, the free press, in this one really important matter, refuses to do the one job the free press is supposed to do, 
Mm -hmm. Tell the fucking truth to the public. Tell us about the disaster. Tell us about the storm. Tell us about the poison in the water. But you can't tell us about the poison in politics because someone, someone way high up the food chain is holding your career by a thread saying, if you say one fucking word, saying Republicans are exclusively to blame for these problems, we're going to cut you loose. And then you can go have a blog and a podcast like Drift Glass. So Drift Glass, let me ask the blogger podcaster drift class a question about sure because you have in our notes you know the ecstasy of joe scarborough over yes. <laughs> mike bloomberg mike running bloomberg, for president bloomberg, yeah. because he's going to be the magic billionaire right he's oh gonna... <laughs> god you know, i don't think you people outside understand what a magnificent piece of man he is <laughs> he's got a dick a mile long <laughs> let me tell you this guy personally he built the pyramids blue gal uh-huh. i don't think you know that and there well was is the... this is this because is is bloomberg Coming into the race, first of all, he's so late that I don't think he can get on the ballot in the first three contests. I think doesn't he's... need you, Blue Gal. Doesn't need you. He can buy the state of California out of petty cash. He's got the sucker locked up. Let me tell you, he's a viable candidate. You know why? Because he's fucking rich and he lives yeah. in New York. He lives five blocks from Joe Scarborough. And he, can, he can ride in and be on Joe Scarborough every single morning. He doesn't even need to phone it in like Trump did. Do you remember um, um, Inception? Yeah. Where they're trying to figure out how to get on the airlines and the, the, the uh, Ken Watton obviously says, yeah. I just bought the airline. I bought the airline it's and now we have a flight. It, Let's it's go. simpler that way. Like, <laughs> Bloomberg could just buy MSNBC. You know, and, right. and Joe Scarborough right. respects one thing, two things, money and power. And, yeah. and Bloomberg has both and of those. Keep, keep my pharma stocks and my bank stocks right. stable. Don't Gotta make me, both. don't yeah. don't shake up those industries at all because my stock portfolio depends on it. Yeah. And you know who had the yeah. best take on Mike Bloomberg coming into the race was Elizabeth Warren. Oh. Because <laughs> she tweeted out, she has a billionaire. She says, welcome to the race, Mike. Um, in case you're wondering how, how this will affect you, she sent over her, how will billionaires be affected by my tax increases <laughs> calculator? <laughs> Just plug in the numbers and see how much you're going to pay. And, and I, I, loved, that, I did love what my TV husband, Ellie Mistel, said about, you know, there are probably maybe 7,400 people in America who will be affected by Elizabeth Warren's billionaire tax. And I think those would, guys don't vote in Iowa. No. Well, they'll, they'll just they'll just buy Iowa. Yeah, right. Um, well, and I, I think John Favreau, who I'll give credit for for being funny. He's a funny guy said it's really kind of unfair that Mike Bloomberg, billionaire Mike, billionaire Mike Bloomberg can bring to the table resources that run-of-the-mill billionaires like Tom Sire can't manage. Right, right. And, right. you know, if these guys want to put a giant pile of money in the middle of the country and set it on fire to make a fucking point. Why don't I they have, do downstate races? Uh, because those aren't Take fun. the Senate. Because yeah. you can just sit in the big house in, at the big desk and say, I'm the president and I'm telling you, we're going to have a grand <laughs> bargain. And we're going to cut the... <laughs> Because that's yeah. what they want. That's what all these yep. people ache for. Again, they, they ache for the good old days of the grand bargain. They're going to bring Joe Lieberman back from the political grave and put him in charge of something. And they want uh, they want Graham Rudman. They want Kemp. They want Jack Kemp back. And they're going to pay for it. And they're going to willing to pay an enormous amount of money on the slim chance that they might get it. Because, honestly, Elizabeth Warren scares the shit out of them. I would start off with the theory that we're going to tax you back to the Stone Age. Yeah, I'd yeah. start off by saying, you know what? Let's go back to the the uh, tax bracket of that noble Republican Dwight David Eisenhower. Yeah, let's tax y'all at ninety four percent. Billionaires mm-hmm. get taxed at ninety four percent, or you can reinvest that money in the economy, but you can't sit on it and you can't just lord it over and you can't buy goddamn elections with it. And that's where you begin the negotiation. You don't begin by begging for crumbs. You say, look, the country is in trouble. We are in very big trouble. We are in pre-World War II, World War II trouble, and we need to mobilize the resources of this country to save this country. And one of the resources we're going to have to tap into is the wealth of a few multi-billionaires who sit atop the, the economic pyramid who have profited enormously off of the labor of hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And sorry if you don't like it, but that's what we're going to have to do. Because well, and I think we have to tax companies that buy back their stocks at yes. 110%. That's, <laughs> you have that, to pay a penalty for buying back your own stock. Especially if you with take a tax the, cut. With the, with the massive tax cut. Right. We're going to have, I don't know, 9% growth. Maybe 10. I don't know. I, numbers get big after that. I'm confused. <laughs> but at least 20% growth. 
Uh, this trillion dollar tax cut, which accomplished no, nothing. No, we were supposed to get, if we got 4% growth, that was going to be awesome. That was right? going to be winning, winning, winning. And 6% was probably what it was going to be. It's going to yeah. be amazing. You'll never see anything like it. So much winning. Steve Mnuchin told me so. <laughs> yeah. And then it came to nothing. Yeah. And yeah. we have another trillion dollars for the deficit. And uh, they used it to buy back their stocks. They used it to buy back this their is- stocks. And now Lindsey Graham says on television... Yeah, we ha- we have uh, cashed a check with Social Security and Medicare that we can't afford. Right. Entitlements so are going to have to be reformed, quote unquote. Uh-huh. Oh, grand bargain. And, uh, grand bargain. Oh, grand bargain, please. Yeah. Oh, great grand bargain. Again, they're going to they're going to disinter uh, Joe Lieberman from his political grave and put him in charge of the 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 cat food commission. And that's this is what they dream of. This is the this is the world they want. They do not understand anything about life outside the billionaire bubble. And the people who – most of the people in the media want their approval. You know, Mike Bloomberg can destroy you with a look. So if you're going to survive in the New York media market, you better be make sure – better make sure he's looking at you with a sweet, sweet love in his eye. And so everyone around that table this morning was just like, man, that man is such a hunk of hunk of burning electoral fury. You know, don't count that man out. And I, we're just out here in the country going, we have – it, wasn't it last election – when you people were just killing yourself because there were way too many Republican candidates. Oh yep. my God, yep. the field's full of people. Who? This is insane. Well, Democrats have several very good candidates. We do not need another one. We do not need two or three more. Well, but Drift we- Pass, I, this is what I wanted to ask you as a professional blogger and podcaster, which is, yes. is, is, the, is Bloomberg coming into the race exciting because he's Bloomberg? Or is this exciting because Biden isn't failing to ignite people? Uh, um, I think there's a problem with the Biden campaign. Uh-huh. I think that's pretty self-evident. Yeah. I think Joe yeah. Biden has lost a step. And however carefully Pers- they position him. Personally, I don't think he wants to be president. I really don't. No, that's my I, I don't, gist of it. I, yeah. Based on all available visual evidence, yeah. um, he is not up for a long slog in a tough fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He just isn't. Uh, Hillary Clinton would be, you know. Hillary Clinton would put those gloves lace right back up and get in the ring. She is. She would be ready to go. And I'd be ready to work for her. But that's not going to happen. So the question is, when you have decided that that the future of your party is centrism, and the centrism guy is not cut it, yeah. what do you do? Do you actually accept the fact that the rest of the party has sort of moved on and wants to do something different? Or do you go out and find a multi-billionaire who will say, I'll save you. Don't worry. I can, I can spend a billion dollars out of my own pocket on ads in California. Screw Iowa. Nobody goes to Iowa. Iowa doesn't exist. I'll go to California, just buy that election, and then I'll be competitive. And that's their salvation. Um, It's not going to (laughs) happen. Nobody, as has been reliably reported, uh, New Yorkers hate Michael Bloomberg. Yeah, right. Well, (laughs) and and Michael Michael stop and frisk Bloomberg, right? Yeah. Yeah. And outside of New York, it's Michael who? Yeah. So Michael Bloomberg did not have his own reality show, was not on... uh, was not on The Apprentice. He's just this kind of uh, prissy New York billionaire who thinks that he should be president by an act of God. And that's – unless he wants to go out and start eating corn dogs <laughs> with people who, who want – Too late for that. The fair is over. Yeah, sharing a warm beer with somebody that he wouldn't hire in a billion years. Yeah. Um, because the thing is, what we really want, Blue Gal, is a happy warrior. We want someone who campaigns relentlessly and is, is puts the knife right in Donald Trump's chest electorally, but is cheerful about it, is happy, about it, is hopeful about it. And that's what Elizabeth Warren brings to the campaign. That's what Bernie Sanders brings to yeah. the campaign. Yeah. And and there are other candidates too. This is not an endorsement of anyone. Hey, look, if Joe Biden wins the nomination, I'm a Biden guy. Right. <laughs> Don't get me wrong at all. If Mike Bloomberg buys his way onto the table and somehow <laughs> runs the table and wins. I'm a fucking Bloomberg guy and have been since 1992. Right. And you can, t- and we'll just erase this podcast. And pretend <laughs> it never happened. It'll be gone like a Hannity tweet. <laughs> right. <laughs> Whatever. What? What? Um, but until then, uh, because we are not the New York media and we are not the Beltway media, we are free to speculate all we want right. about what we would like to have and who we would like to have do it. And Michael Bloomberg is neither He's of those things. He's not that person. Neither is Tom DeLay. What no, is it you want no, to talk I about am, Tom uh, DeLay? Is it about Dancing well, with the Stars? No. Oh. Surprisingly, no. Um, going through my archives, as I do from time to time, 
I'm not going to read from my archives, but I recall back in the day when Tom DeLay was the hammer. Remember that? Yes. Tom DeLay was the hammer. Tom DeLay was a force to be reckoned with in the House. Tom DeLay had the entire Republican Party's balls in a bag. And if you crossed him, he would destroy you. Remember that? I do. He was almighty, all powerful, and could ram through anything he damn well pleased. And here's the thing. Everyone knew he was a drunk, sociopath, lying, racist lunatic. Mm -hmm. Every fucking body knew it. But the entire Republican Party was terrified of crossing him. And there was this, towards the end there, once he started to just show up in public and say, yeah, slurring his words, and it was pretty clear that he's going down hard. There was this very fine political calculation about exactly when do we jump off the train? Because <laughs> if it's too soon, we'll be run over under the wheels. And if it's too late, we become a delay person and go down with him. So when exactly, it had nothing to do with their conscience because Republicans don't really have consciences as normal humans nope, it perceive. It was pure them. calculation, right? Pure political calculation based on pure self-preservation. When do we jump off the Tom DeLay train? And we are in exactly that place now. Yeah. Lindsey Graham is going down with the ship. <laughs> you know, he is just, and, and as, as we have mentioned, I believe previously on this podcast, we know how this is going to end. They're all going to say, it wasn't me. I was never there. He was never my guy. I did what I had to do. Gonna, there's going to be a million alibis. And it's up to us who don't have tens of billions of dollars and can't marshal you know, an entire media corporation to say otherwise to stop them from doing that this time. Our job is to get Democrats elected and to stop Republicans and the media from weaseling out of responsibility for the mess we are in. Those are our two jobs. And how we do them, again, I'm a pragmatist, is negotiable, but we have to do them. Yeah, and I think I think you're these... seeing a lot of what you're talking about on Fox News as well, because Hannity yes. is going down with the Trump train. Yes, he is. But uh, this morning on Fox and Friends, Ed Henry, who is, you know, a Las Vegas sex machine from 2016, yeah. he had a, he is, an affair is, with a Vegas quote unquote hostess, had to take yes. some time off from work to get his life together because it was exposed. That happens. That he had an incredible sex drive. And <laughs> uh, but Ed Henry is back and uh, he is the one of the straight news guys at Fox, you know, oh, good. which is. Mm -hmm. Utter, utter bullshit. They are all liars. So just remember mm -hmm. that. But Ed Henry was on sitting on the couch on Fox and Friends talking about how awesome Jeff Sessions is. That Jeff Sessions was Trump before Trump was ever Trump and was almost too conservative. You know, mm -hmm. that's yeah. <laughs> what they really mean is racist. Yeah, that's but, be clear. Uh, you know, that that he didn't get a federal judgeship because he was too racist. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't mention that on Fox and Friends. But Ed Henry gave basically a five minute infomercial about Jeff Sessions running for Senate in Alabama. And he was Trump before Trump. And so if you're a true conservative, you're really going to want to go with Jeff Sessions. Sure. Because look at that face. <laughs> look at that face. Look that at that mother... little munchkin face, that little oh. Hebler elf. So. I thought I watched that and I thought, oh, my gosh, can you imagine how many phone calls Jeff Sessions people, mm -hmm. how many how many Fox people are on the Rolodex of the Jeff Sessions campaign? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of them. Lots of them. Mm -hmm. And it's that connection there and all those chits that he's going to collect from Fox News. The relationship that he has with Fox is definitely going to outlast Donald Trump. You have a couple other things you want to talk about. Um, we you want wanted, to congratulate an author, right? I do. You know, as a fellow writer <laughs> who has not yet had the time or, frankly, nerve to write a book and watch it fail catastrophically, <laughs> um, I would like to send a big shout out to Mark Halperin, uh, who wrote a book, <laughs> How to Beat Trump, which looks eerily like the book that Rick Wilson is now touting called beat the devil how to beat trump and how to basically tell the democrats to quit fucking around and be the party i want them to be yeah um mark halperin's how to beat trump book sold 502 copies in the first week <laughs> 502 copies now you know what i could sell 503 copies yeah i really could yeah. i just if i beg my family to buy them i can sell 503 <laughs> copies could. and mark halperin tv's mark halperin uh, who who is who got to everybody who who again cranked out the Rolodex 
and went through every contact he had. So you got to give me a quote, man. I got to get back in the game and got quotes from everybody who immediately regretted it because Mark Halperin yeah. um, has sold his book for, has sold 502 copies of his book. I hope he got a huge advance, mm-hmm. huge, mm-hmm. like a, give me $3 million yeah, um, and has to pay back all of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I really do hope so. Cause Mark Halperin is just a bottom. He feeding ruined a guy. lot of lives. He yeah, did. He, he did. did. And, and the more he suffers to the point where he either repents or goes and get a job, you know, equivalent to his skill set mm-hmm. of selling hot apple pies at a local McDonald's, perhaps. That's what Mark Halpern's future should be. And 502 copies of his shitty book. I mean, he's going to sit there going, Donald Trump Jr.'s shitty book is outselling Well, because the book. RNC is like buying it in massive more. quantities well, to give away, right? That's right. the thing. And there's and there's no one who will buy Mark Halpern's book in massive quantities to hand out right. the next CPAC because yeah. Mark Halpern. It, he, I, I look forward to him sort of in the very, very back tent of Politicon <laughs> next year with just crates of his book and a felt pen going, you know, I used, I used to be to Mark, Mark Halpern. Halpern. Right, right. Now, yeah. class, I tried to call in to Sam Cedar's show while you were out of town. I hope you're not mad at me for that. Oh, oh whoa, 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 whoa. I'm out of town for one day. And what I was like, Hey, how's Sam, going, how's Sam? it going, babe? Remember me? <laughs> Sam, so what you uh, doing? And I didn't get on because he had too many callers, but uh, I wanted to thank him publicly uh, for covering the rebranding efforts that Milo Yiannopoulos and Charlie Kirk are doing for their images to soften their image and become more centrist. Right. Uh, Charlie right. Kirk had a gay black man on stage with him, you know, rapping, sitting on stools, talking the talking about how we move the country forward and stuff. And uh, Sam played a clip of this where this man in the audience, a Charlie Kirk audience, had a uh, rosary wrapped around his hand. And he was insisting uh-huh. on asking um, how anal sex helps us win the culture wars. Well, that's just true. <laughs> That's just true. Anal sex no. always helps you in the culture wars. It, it always works. <laughs> Everyone uh, says it. And Charlie Kirk was sitting next to a gay black man who's also a conservative who also wanted to say, well, why don't you ask me that question? Let's ask me that question directly, you know. Uh, and and Charlie Kirk rejected the premise of the question. So it mo- that was the end of the clip that well, Sam Cedar played. To be, to be fair, there's an entire chapter in Mark Halpern's book, How to Be Trump, <laughs> on anal sex. <laughs> And anal rosary. sex and winning the culture wars against yeah. rosaries, right? A whole chapter, <laughs> a whole chapter on it. But you know these rebranding efforts—it's it's the canary in the coal mine. When you see yeah. Milo Yiannopoulos outing Richard Spencer for being yes. anti-Jewish, that dude, wasn't exactly dude. outing. <laughs> You're not with the band anymore. You're not with the band. <laughs> and 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 we are all. On the outside, watching the the rats fight among themselves. Honestly, who's going how to, to get out through the each last other as bad people? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, there's you're one, all bad people. <laughs> there, yeah, there's one more seat on the life raft. No, that's not the life raft. That's the boat that takes you across the river sticks yeah, to hell. Right. And you're all going to go on it, and you're all going to hell together because you're all just fucking bad terrible people. people. And the idea that Milo Yiannopoulos is now the good guy. No, right. <laughs> he's not. Well, you know how effective every cop show. You know, you and I have been watching uh, Jim Jim Gardner. We've we been watching, been reruns watching of Rockford, Rockford Files, Files from day one, from and it, the and beginning, right? The old good Nazi, bad Nazi thing is a classic, <laughs> classic um, <laughs> interrogation technique. You know, there's the Nazi who wants to help you, and you know, and the Nazi who's not the so hench- good, not so nice, the henchman, they, right? The henchman Nazi, <laughs> and that's what they're been. And and I wish them all the luck in the world. I wish them all the luck they deserve. But it's the canary in the coal mine to notice that it's these guys who really need to scrape, right, to make money and get attention. Well, that there's no gonna, more room. Then right, exactly, exactly, yeah. And the, and many of them have been kicked off of social media for being yeah. awful, awful people. And mm-hmm. if you, <laughs> it's it if you've been kicked off of Twitter for being yeah. awful in that regard, right. like kicked off. Kipped off. When Jack is really trying to make sure he doesn't delete every Republican <laughs> from Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you you're you have to scrape to get back on some way, have an yeah. audience somehow. 
And, and this is Canary it. in the Coal Mine stuff. So let's face it. If Bill Maher only has four seats at that table. And That's right. <laughs> he can only squeeze in one Nazi <laughs> every week. Dead to me. Yeah. Dead to me. Yeah. Bill Maher is dead to me. Yeah. Uh, not just for the anti-vaxxing stuff he did last week. No. Since he had Milo Yiannopoulos on his show yeah. thinking it's cute. Yeah. Well, thinking it's cute and will get an audience and be good television. Dead to me. And Dead his, to and me. And he spent twenty last 20 years rehabbing Ann Coulter's career every time right. she drove into a tree. Because and that, it's good television. Yeah. It's good, oh. you know, it's the, yeah, no, no. Um, but this is, you know, their efforts are nothing compared to what we have coming yeah. in terms of oh. a very well-funded, oh, massive effort to rebrand the Republican Party as something yes. other than Donald Trump. Yes, and we and we know it's coming. This is the thing. We know it's coming. You know, yeah. We little bloggers and podcasters and our, and our wonderful listeners out there, you all know this is coming. You Watch all know exactly it. how this yep. is coming. You're yep. watching Jaws for the 45th time. You, <laughs> you know, know what's coming. Shaw do, do, is going to get do, do, do. bitten in half. You just know that's going to happen. <laughs> and you know the shark's going to blow up. You know exactly. So our job in our little, in our own little ways, in our among our family and friends, you got to hold people accountable. You've yeah. got to hold people accountable for what they said and did. You're living through some of the worst times in American history right now. This is not the Great Depression. It's not World War II. But this is a d- catastrophe for this country. Uh, internationally, nationally, for our, for our image of ourselves. We elected a fucking monster. And a third of this country stands firmly behind evil and is proud of it. And it is vitally important that we hold these people accountable and not let them walk away from the disaster they created again. Because if they do, if they get away with it again, the next time it will be worse. The next time when President Cotton, Cotton, as you said, yeah. Tom Cotton's going to be president of the United States. So just, and then, and then democracy's over. So. Yeah. All right, Drift Class, we got to rush into the news roundup. Let's go. Well, this is today's the day that transcripts for Trump's ex Russia and ex Ukraine experts were released, which confirmed everything the whistleblower said. A federal judge overturned the Trump administration's conscience rule that would have made it easier for doctors and other healthcare workers to refuse abortion care on religious or moral grounds. And today, acting chief of staff and everything else, Mick Mulvaney, decided to blow off a subpoena and refused to testify in the House impeachment hearings, because that's what innocent people always do, Blue Gal. <laughs> According to the federal prosecutor's opening statement at the trial of Roger Stone, this is going to be a circus, people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stone lied to Congress about his efforts to contact WikiLeaks during the 2016 campaign because, quote, the truth looked bad for Donald Trump, yeah. unquote. Yeah, it always does. Uh, next week is public impeachment trial week, so get your popcorn and booze ready. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a uh, testimony in the House uh, Impeachment Committee on TV. Jim Jordan knew. Mm-hmm. Yes, he, he did. He knew about the abuse of wrestler students. He did and did nothing about it. And he's he's turned that into a profession of ignoring blatant abuse directly in front of him. He's very good at this. And now uh, he's on the impeachment committee He as of today. Well, in Republican honor of Republican Republic. impeachment trial week, uh, Turkish President uh, er- Erdogan will visit the White House. So that'll be exciting. And thank you to everyone who corrected my pronunciation a few weeks ago of Erdogan. I appreciate mm-hmm. it. Uh, Senate Republicans are discussing whether to use the impeachment inquiry to throw mud at Joe Biden and also uh, subpoena Hunter Biden. Yeah, of course they are. After prayerfully meditating on the possibility of going to jail for Donald Trump, Gordon Sondland's temporary amnesia suddenly disappeared, and he recalled that, yes, by golly, there was a quid pro quo linking the U.S. to Ukraine with an investigation to Joe Biden and his son, specifically that Ukraine, quote, would likely not receive military aid until it publicly committed to investigating the 2016 election and Joe Biden. The whole point was to get him to stand up at a microphone and say, investigation, Biden and son. That was it. Didn't even have to happen. They just had to have something to hang their hat on. And they wrote a script for him to say that. Yeah. Yeah. The House committees in charge of the Trump impeachment inquiry plan subpoenaed acting White House chief of staff Mick Mulvaney for testimony, and he's not showing up. This week, Donald Trump, you've heard of him before, he's a bit on TV mm-hmm. a lot, had to pay $2 million to settle the New York Attorney General civil lawsuit against the Trump Foundation and his children. Because he used his foundation as a piggy bank. Yeah. Because yeah, that's what honest people do. I think this was my favorite story of the week. Oh, God. Because it was so Driftless. so pathetic and creepy and wrong. Lindsey Graham, I'm refusing to read any of the transcripts released this week. Yes. <laughs> This is the same guy who demanded that they be released. 
yes, and right. said, well, you know, if there was uh, some hint of a quid pro quo, then I'd be concerned. And of course, Lindsey now Graham. La, 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 right. la, la. I'm right. not even going to read them because they're all baloney. No. No. <laughs> Head down, ass up. Lindsey Graham. Yay. <laughs> The Trump administration has now formally withdrawn our country from the Paris Climate Agreement. If you need a reason to vote in November for the Democrat, Mm -hmm. vote blue no matter who. Yep. Swallow your pride, vote blue no matter who. That's it right there. Uh, Phone records show that Trump made at least six phone calls to a woman who says he sexually assaulted her at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, 62% of Trump supporters say there is nothing Trump could do that would cause them uh, cause him to lose their support. And I believe all of them are on Twitter today and mad at me. <laughs> and they're mad at you for yeah. calling them out. Yes. yes. <laughs> I do like how you're just replying that I don't care what you think. I don't care. I don't care what you say. <laughs> a lot of them have a fetish about, you know, uh, Republicans were uh, freed the slaves in Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, I live three miles from where he's buried. By the way, here's a picture of Barack Obama with the Lincoln impersonator going, and Lincoln impersonator saying, we have a black president while my party must be doing great. So that sort of <laughs> that sort of crystallizes all the shit that I or Kevin Cruz could say, because yeah. these people either know better and they've just been trained to say stupid shit, or they don't know any better and they're basically human cinder blocks. No, they've and been be given educated. one line speaking points. Right that they believe will help them own the libs. Right. And, and I it, don't, yeah. And you I don't, don't care. care. If you don't, don't care, care, your opinion is irrelevant eliminates to me. it. Right. right. <laughs> An attorney for the whistleblower whose complaint is at the center of the impeachment inquiry has issued a cease and desist letter to the white house. Yeah. Over Trump's attacks against the whistleblower. Donald Trump's accounting firm, not him, but his accounting firm, must now turn over eight years of Trump's personal and corporate tax returns to Manhattan prosecutors. <laughs> well, that that is, uh, we're waiting to hear if the Supreme Court is going to take up that case. Yeah. Everyone in the legal community who is sane says that the Supreme Court will not take it up. No. Because it's it's cut and dried. You want to touch this? Not, not with a barge nope. pole. No. Nope. 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 We're not here right now. Tell them them we're not home. (laughs) Tell them we're not home. We're not home. Mm -hmm. Trump ordered Attorney General William Barr to hold a press conference and say that he didn't break the law during his July 25th call with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, And Barr declined to do it. There are some things that William Barr will not do, apparently. Yes. That was remarkable. That was the remarkable thing about that. That was the him and Lindsey Graham. You know, Lindsey Graham, there's no bottom. There's no bottom to what Lindsey Graham will do at all. (laughs) Bill Barr just decided, you know what? I think I'm full. <laughs> I think we've reached the point where even I can't a, go on television and no, do this. Uh, yes, even my right. children will throw my shit out the window and set it on fire if I do yeah. this. So yeah. you know what? Uh, and of course, the stink of oh shit, we're all going down. Yeah, uh, it is thick in the air in D.C. And there now, is desperation. Yep, yep. Former National Security Advisor and Resistance Hero John Bolton. <laughs> no, he's not. <laughs> no, he's not. He's a lunatic. Uh, is willing to testify to the House uh, uh, impeachment inquiry as long as a court orders him to do it and apparently drags him in and sits him down. Then Mm -hmm. he'll do it because that's what heroes do. They make a court order you to tell the truth. The half million dollars that Rudy Giuliani was paid to investigate Trump's political rivals came from the Long Island attorney investing in Fraud Guarantee, a company owned by that Ukrainian-American businessman. I just never get tired. Uh, There's a book by someone named Anonymous, but not the last Anonymous, and not the Anonymous before that, and not the author of the Anonymous op-ed columns that keep popping up in newspapers. This is a different Anonymous. Uh, Is a senior Trump administration official who says that high-level White House aides were certain that Mike Pence would support using the 25th Amendment to have Trump removed from office uh, as long as nobody talked about it. As long as someone else actually pulled the trigger, he'd he'd be for it. I'm with charlie pierce on this yeah expect me to mock whoever this is for their cowardice yeah. behind behind it yeah um, charlie pierce who figured out there was mark felt before anybody else did yep and who figured yep. out that it was joe klein before anybody else did. yep um, does, does he think it's Rance previous uh he doesn't say but he says okay. i will mock whoever it is expect me to mock whoever it is yeah and and don't buy this book no. rachel maddow read from it and that's interesting and you can knit to listening to rachel maddow read from it Right. But don't give this guy, don't give this person any money for writing this shit. No. They need, they should have come out 
three years ago and said what was going on and demanded that a 25th Amendment be passed. All right. Trump and The Apprentice creator have discussed shooting The Apprentice White House after Trump leaves office. We prefer the idea of lock up with the stars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Bill Taylor, who is the top U.S. diplomat in Ukraine, told House impeachment investigators that it was his, quote, clear understanding, unquote, that military aid could not be sent to Ukraine until the country pursued investigations that could benefit Trump, according to a transcript of his testimony that was made public. He He's, he, quote, sat in astonishment, unquote, during a July 18th call after a White House Office of Management and Budget official said that Trump had ordered a hold on military assistance to Ukraine. Guilty as sin. These All of these people are guilty as sin, and, and most of them, I think, are going to go down. Yep. Uh, the only person who's immune from consequences really is Donald Trump, and the only reason he's immune is a guy named Mitch McConnell. Yep. Keep the faith, people. Next week's going to be a barn burner with yeah. a televised testimony. So Holy crap, you know, just uh, keep the faith and we're with you. Love you guys. Have I yeah. said that lately? Have I told yeah. you lately, list podcast listeners, that I love you? Yes. These are great folks and we really do appreciate it. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an internet kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's internet kitty is really something. This is Simba. Simba is an actual lion. And this photo was taken by Jeff, a podcast listener who visited Tan Tanzania. And uh, he said, he wrote us and said, in the Serengeti, rule number one is don't get out of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, I realize how much I depend on you guys to help ferry us through the current war of all against all to which our misleaders are constantly directing us. Rule number one in America should be stay on the pro-left bus, which is what I plan to do. I am mm -hmm. going to Patreon today and pledging my $5 a month, which, if nine other people do the same, should cover your hosting bill each month. Oh. Consider this the start of my campaign to sustain the Professional Left podcast. Oh, aren't you special? Thank you Thank very you. much, Jeff. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, and while Simba eats his prey on the Serengeti, uh, your little lion will love the taste of freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your pet will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Simba at our Facebook page or website. You can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or say it with me. U.S. Postal Service, go, go postal, postal unions. unions. Yeah. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Their busy, busy season is coming and they we are. are with you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, go Postal Unions. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. We got coffee from Bard, as we said. Yeah. Uh, if you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us by donating to our podcast. This is not charity. This is our job and a labor of love. And uh, we love hearing from you, and we're grateful for your $5 contribution or more if you can afford it. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. We have PayPal, postal address information, Patreon, GoFundMe, all of it is there at ProLeftPod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. And one more note, uh, Science Fiction University is going to be released Thanksgiving weekend. Yes. The episodes that we have in the can, that's how we've decided to do it uh, this time around, at least, at least for this season. We're going to do uh, release our shows Thanksgiving weekend, mm -hmm. uh, and then again, Christmas week. Uh, we will release some more shows. And then um, gather your feedback. Get, hear get, from get your listeners. feedback. See what you guys think of it. Mm -hmm. uh, those of you that like listening to that. And if you don't, then just skip that week and come back to us. Uh, we'll be back with political podcasting the following week. Yeah. but that but, we, And we're really trying to find out if this, if this separate podcast, non-political podcast, is sustainable. Because it's a labor right. of love, but it's also labor. It's a lot it's of... Also, and it's a lot of work. It's a yeah. lot more than just... I mean, Drift Class and I cover politics for our blogs and I write for crooks and liars. And yeah. so we're watching news 24 seven anyway, and podcasting about it is something that we like to do. 
um, reading science fiction books and watching science fiction movies and then really kind of coming together with a show about that is a whole different activity. And it's fun, but it's a lot of work. So we want to make sure that the, from your feedback that we really uh, can take this on. So thank you very much. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties want to remind Republicans that their vote for Sean Spicer also legally counted as a vote for Trump 2020. So they can just stay home next year and enjoy all the winning. Are they going to put out a Facebook ad saying that, Drift Class? Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.